on a hot sun that shines down on Portland International Raceway, and we're ready for the start of the Budweiser G.I. Joe's 200 for the IndyCars. Hello, I'm Paul Page, and now ESPN begins their coverage of the IndyCars for the 1989 season, and we'll carry it all the way until we crown the PPG IndyCar World Series champion at Laguna Seca Raceway in October. Now, if you would have gone back to the start of the season, you really would have given the entire season to the Penske team. That's what everybody thought. The right cars, the right drivers, the right engine combinations, they were really appearing to be unbeatable. But then things after Rick won at Phoenix changed. Emerson Fittipaldi and Rick Mears at this moment are tied in the points fight. Down the ladder, Al Unser Jr. and, of course, Michael Andretti. Any one of those four drivers at the end of this day could take the lead in that points fight. But for the Penske team, well, there is some concern. Rick Mears has to carry the flag now. Danny Sullivan has a broken arm. Johnny Rutherford, three-time Indianapolis 500-mile race champion. It's a tough job for Mears. Well, it really is. As you say, he was the standard bearer or is the standard bearer for Penske team. He's not been doing that well in road racing in the last few years since his accident in 1983 in uh, Canada. So he's, he's been struggling, and he would like nothing more than to come away from today leading those points and having a firm grasp on that. Emerson Fittipaldi, he's on a roll. He's doing things right. He has learned how to race American style well, as, he, as we've witnessed with all of the bump and run racing that we've seen so far this season. And of course, Emerson would like to become only the second driver in the history of racing to put together a Formula One World Championship, an IndyCar World Championship, and an Indianapolis victory. Mario Andretti being the only driver to have ever accomplished that. And certainly one of the stories we'll be covering. But there are many more and some surprises here. Let's go down the pit area. Here's Jack Aroot. Well, Paul, there have been a lot of surprises here, especially during qualifications over the last couple of days. Emerson Fittipaldi on a terrific roll was one of the strong contenders, but two fuel pumps going out on him forced him to settle for the outside pole. But the biggest surprise was the end of an 18-month journey by these people, Porsche, as they plank Teo Fabi in their Porsche car on the pole for the first time in history. And a man that really, some say, should take a lot of the credit for such a great accomplishment is Derek Walker, who came on board just about eight months ago. And Derek, a lot of people said, wait for this team to come together. Now you have, you've won a pole, but now what's more importantly is when are you going to win a race? Well, that's true. We're a long way. You know, we've come a long way to get to here, and there's an even bigger task ahead to, to win this race. But we feel we're in the best uh, position we've ever had to win the race. We feel quite confident today. Some people say that the, while the chassis works very, very well, the March chassis, that the Porsche engine is still down on horsepower. Will that be a disadvantage to you here? Uh, I don't think it's as big as a disadvantage as people make out. It, we're a lot closer here than we've been. I think we've done some things since uh, Detroit that are beginning to make a difference. So um, we've got a long way to go, but we're a lot closer than people would imagine. There are some other stories that have been taking place here as well. And for those, let's check in with Gary Gerald. Well, Jack... In a constant effort to upgrade this Portland racing facility, the organizers recently resurfaced much of the racetrack, trying to make it smoother and quicker. Unfortunately, the combination of record-breaking temperatures in excess of 90 degrees the past couple of days and the tremendous side force from IndyCars at speed has resulted in a raveling or a tearing in some of the apex of some of the corners. Consequently, the last two nights, maintenance crews have been working overtime virtually all night long, making repairs. Organizers are confident the problem has been corrected. We are ready to go racing. And here now, at the start of the grid, standing by to give the traditional starting command for this field is the Honorable Senator from the State of Oregon, Mark Hatfield. Gentlemen, start your engines. when this day is over? Or will that Quaker State Porsche be a car that finally scores its first victory? A lot of promise here today, Johnny Rutherford. Yes, Paul, you're right. There are a lot of questions to be answered, and we'll find out at the end of the day. But uh, I think the Porsche is uh, probably the one that's been working and gnawing and doing just what he's doing, getting to the front. 
So it's uh, they're all getting ready, and there was uh, Teo Fabi as we as we spoke of him, and this is going to be a good, good, strong race. We got a glimpse there for a moment over the right shoulder of Al Unser Jr., who starts this race a bit back. There you see it. You see his highly computerized dash display now, which gives him so much more information than before. And the front row at green and white number eight sits to the inside, ready to roll out. The first time in some time the tail Bobby has been on the pole of a race. As now he begins to inch forward. The front row begins to roll away. The second row follows quickly. 26 Indy cars are ready to go. Let's take a look at the starting grid. On the pole is the Porsche, driven by Teo Fabi. It's his first IndyCar pole since 1983. Outside is Emerson Fittipaldi. All eight of his career wins have been at different tracks, but he's not yet won here at Portland. The second row, Mario Andretti, a two-time Portland winner. Third row, Ari Leyendijk. Both his best career start and best career finish were here last year. Outside is Rick Mears, who is tied in the points with Emerson Fittipaldi. The fourth row, Michael Andretti, who finished second at Portland two different times. Bobby Rahal is outside, who won here in 1987. The fifth row is Al Unser Jr., who scored his first career win here in 1984. And outside is Scott Brayton, his best career finish ever was here in 1987 when he finished fifth. The sixth row is rookie Scott Pruitt. Outside is Irishman Derek Daly. Kevin Cogan on the inside of the seventh row. And Raul Boisel of Brazil to the outside. The inside of the eighth row is Didier Tays of Belgium. And Canada's John Jones. The ninth row is Dominic Dobson. And Italy's Fabrizio Barbazza. Twelfth row, Roberto Guerrero in the Alfa Romeo. And Scott Atchison. The thirteenth row, Guido Daco of Italy. And Jean-Pierre Fry of Switzerland. So that's your starting field. They've completed the first of three parade laps before a start here behind the PPG pace cars. Let's go to the pits, Gary Gerald. Well, Paul, a year ago, Danny Sullivan, of course, was driving out of this pit for Roger Penske. He got a victory here at Portland. Today, he's on the sideline. Doctor's orders. He's got to rest that broken forearm suffered in the Indy practice crash a month or so ago. Jeff Brabham gets a one-shot try today for Roger Penske. He's qualified the car in the second row. Brabham has absolutely dominated the IMSA circuit the last two years. He's won 15 of the last 20 events. But in 85 times in an Indy car, he has never been a winner. He's come close. He told me just a short time ago he knows knows that he has the best opportunity today that he's ever had in an Indy car. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of pressure, not only uh, from the team and, and Miller and all Penske's organization, but for myself, because I feel this is the best opportunity I've ever had, the best car, the best team, and uh, it's a one-shot deal, so it's now or never. Well, Jeff Rabham confident, he's quick, he's in the second row, he knows he's going to make the best of this one-shot opportunity, Paul. All right, so the crowd now begins to come to its feet as the cars continue to work their way around the circuit. We say good afternoon to them and to you as ESPN begins their coverage of the Indy cars. Allen Sir Jr. Absolutely no chance of rain. Been a beautiful time here for the Indy cars. 
Now the pace begins to pick up just a bit. Some of the stats on this track. We've already seen a new track record with regard to the pole qualifying. Will we see a race record before this day is over? And of course, we expect the fuel to carry them to about 37 laps for their first stop. And fuel should be a factor here today as the acceleration begins. And Taylor Bobby picks up the green flag and heads into the first turn as Taylor leads that field down with Fittipaldi struggling to find position behind him. And Andretti dropping in, followed by Jeff Bravo. Boy, there's a crowd down there now, Paul. Look at that. But everybody looks like they're getting through the chicane without any problem. Teo is down in turn two, making that sweeper to the right. He has convincingly moved out to the lead, into turn three. One of the questions about this car in the lead, the green and white number eight, that Porsche, is whether or not it has the stamina to run this race. But, of course, one of the considerations is fared fairly well at Detroit, which is a very, very rough track. There and one car looks like Steve having a problem yeah. already. A lot of uh, vapor coming out the back of that engine, and it looked oily. Looks like his day may be done very quickly here. Could be. Looks like it's cleared up now. You know, it's very hard to figure this car. There, there the smoke is again, so he's got a definite problem. Something is leaking underneath the engine cover. Coming to the conclusion of lap number one as Fittipaldi comes way to the inside trying to find room to race tail Bobby. They'll go into the chicane side by side and Bobby breaks harder, gets there first. Fittipaldi drops the second. Well, I tell you what, tail Bobby has, uh, wants to lead this race. He is out there going for it. And, of course, Emerson Fittipaldi, knowing that he doesn't have quite what it takes to keep up right now, will sit there and dog him, and that's the way you do it. Fittipaldi, very, very aggressive, as he has been all season in that number 20 Marlboro machine. As they battle for the lead, Mario Andretti is there in third. You just got a glimpse of him as we watch Fittipaldi. And Tom Steva makes his stop. Obviously, something seriously wrong back in the engine room. Little fan flash of fire, but yeah, that's not a problem. They've got something leaking back there that shouldn't be, and it's causing a little bit of a fire. And they're trying to cool it down, dumping a little water on some of the uh, outer parts. Terrible disappointment for Vince Granatelli and the STP team as we take a look back to the front of the field. Can Teo Fabi continue to hold off a charging Emerson Fittipaldi? Mario Andretti is in third, then Jeff Brabham, and then Michael Andretti begins to challenge Jeff Brabham in the fight now for fourth place. as well. Yes, Michael was able to make his point to move right up in there. You can see he can close with, with just a spurt, so he's he's really got the gearing right, and he uh, can, can move in. Of course, Jeff is one that's going to sit there and run a good, steady race. He doesn't want to make any mistakes today, so I'm sure he's getting the feel of the car and getting settled down. Jeff Brabham really in the spotlight here today. Driving for the Penske team, it's a one-time opportunity because next week it will be Al Anser in that car. And Jeff Brabham wants to show just as good as he can. Of course, he'd love to win, but at least for the early going, he's going to have to be very careful. Michael Andretti continues the challenge, and then Rick Mears sits back behind Michael Andretti. As hot as it is here today, Paul, these guys, I think, are going to really kind of take it easy in this first going, or at least I would if I were out there, trying to get a feel for the car, set the pace, and watch the temperatures. Michael continues to dog at the back end of Jeff Brabham's car. Now, Jeff has been particularly successful in the GTP cars for the past year and a half. John, do you think that has an influence on how he will now approach this race? Does he come in feeling stronger because he is a winner? Well, I think, Paul, that the, he knows this racetrack. He has won with the GTP cars out here, so he has the opportunity of that knowledge, and uh, that's going to help him quite a bit, but he has not run the Indy cars that much, and there is a difference. They're a little flightier. They are uh, quicker responding, I think, so it's a situation where he's going to learn the car. All right, so Jeff Brabham continues to run in fourth place. Let's go to the pitch, Jack Aroo. Well, Tom Steve, it's an early day out for you. They thought they might have had a turbo fire, but nobody's really sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. It was making some noises when we tried to refire it, so it might, it might have dropped a valve or something. We lost the motor yesterday in qualifying, and then, uh, you know, they stuck a new one in for today, but we didn't have a chance to run it before the start of the race. How frustrating is it for a driver such as yourself to be out so very early in an event? Well, 
actually better than running, uh, you know, 90% of the race and then falling out. But, uh, you know, it's sort of an R&D program with the STP Buick, and uh, the guys are working real hard. It's just a struggle to run this uh, production motor against all these racing motors. Well, Paul, he's got to have a little bit of reason to smile because he looks at Porsche after 18 months. They've sat on the pole, and maybe the Buick team can do likewise next time they come to Portland. Well, certainly if his car owner, Vince Granatelli, has the kind of patience, and every indication is that he does. As a matter of fact, they're already talking about the engine development program on that car for next year, hoping perhaps for a, a little more of a, a little fancy metals, titanium and aluminum coming more and more into that block as we continue to watch the battle for fourth place, the Miller car of Jeff Brabham. He continues to try to hold off the charge being put at his rear by Michael Andretti. Boy, he has become an Andretti sandwich there. He's, he's in between uh, Michael and Mario, and uh, they are going at it. Michael still persisting and pushing, pushing, getting very close, trying every chance he can. So the battle really for third, fourth, and fifth right now. You might note from time to time that Pennzoil machine of Rick Mears, the bright yellow car, is also closed up and joining in this fight as well, as is Ari Leyendijk currently running in seventh in the Provimi car. As he's closed in as well, at the front of the field, it's still Teo Fabi holding off Emerson Fittipaldi. This is where the fight is. Jeff Brabham, car number one, of course, replacing Danny Sullivan, whose doctor said, don't try another race with that, that broken arm. Take it easy, let it rest. You can come back in a couple of races. Back at the front of the field, it is still Teo Fabi, leading Emerson Fittipaldi. We'll be back with more right after this. Miles an hour on the backside of the circuit. Here at Portland International, I'm Paul Page with Johnny Rutherford, Gary Gerald, and Jack Aroot. That's Ari Leyendijk, the Provimi car, sitting just ahead. Most of the fighting in this race thus far has centered around these positions, starting with Mario Andretti in third. He leads an entire train as Al Unser comes to the inside of Ari Leyendijk as they approach the chicane at the end of the home track, and he gets past some of the other players in this fight as Michael Andretti continues to chop at the back of Jeff Brabham in a battle for fourth place. Yes, Mario has pulled out a little bit of a lead there away from uh, Jeff Brabham, but Michael is still hammering on him from the backside. So Jeff has his work cut out for him and uh, cannot slip at all. It's a situation where any one of these guys makes a slight mistake. The rest of them have got him, so uh, he's pushing for it. And we see Rick Mears coming up, closing in with the crowd there. And Al Unser Jr. coming in behind him, so that is the battle. On the backside of the course again, Rick Mears took a shot at Michael Andretti there. Mears in the bright yellow car is feeling very, very racy on this course. He's had his number six placed about anywhere he wants it, and he seems very satisfied with the way it's handling. Yes, and it's still very early, and that's uh, it's kind of Rick's M.O. He sits back there and waits till he gets his chance, and then he makes his move. So uh, here we see they're coming into some slower traffic now. Uh, you can also get an idea. The leaders are running about six seconds ahead, and I think touched. As Brabham and Michael Andretti got together there, Michael continues to keep right at him. Doesn't appear that any problem was caused by that. I can't see any damage on the front of Michael's car. No, I think they just touched tires, Paul. And, of course, this new area, you can see it's very black. Uh, uh, here is coming up. There's one of the patches that they've had to make on it. But there's all new paving, and the car seems to be sticking, and that's the increase for the speed. Rick Mears comes to the outside of Michael, tries to get past, gives it a real good pitch out there. Can't get it done, but comes to the inside and drives Michael again. So what a few moments ago was Michael trying to catch Jeff Brabham has now become a very aggressive Rick Mears in that yellow car number four yeah. trying to get past Michael. Yes, Rick is uh, feeling his oats. Here we have the, the leaders again, Teo Fabi and Emerson Fittipaldi. Emerson is not getting outrun by any means. He is hanging right in there, so they're just out there kind of sparring right now. Emo is uh, getting his car, getting a feel for his car, the way it's set up, and it looks as though uh, the Porsche is definitely uh, definitely on the point and uh, not going to be caught soon. Well, it's the start of the race. You heard Derek Walker say that he doesn't think that their Porsche engine is giving that much away to Chevrolet, and it certainly doesn't seem like it. It seems like the Porsche is really capable of holding its own. Well, it certainly appears that way with the, them grabbing the pole and now leading the race. We were talking about the, uh, the potential Penske dominance at the beginning of this season. It seems, too, that a lot of what is happening in the season all comes from Penske, even if not directly controlled by Penske. For example, here is Fittipaldi challenging for the lead right now, a winner at Indianapolis, tied to the points with Rick Mears, driving a Penske car.
as Fittipaldi now tries that approach down the inside to the right. And once again, Bobby just drives right across the front of him and maintains his position. Now, also, the Porsche has a pesky connection because the team manager and the chief mechanic, Derek Walker and Peter Parrott, both came from the Penske operation last year. Let's go to the pits, Gary Gerald. Well, another story that's really interesting that relates to the Penske operation. Rick Mears and his crew had a very long night. Electronic problems in the final practice session yesterday. They couldn't find or pinpoint the problem. They worked till midnight. He changed the engine, changed all the electronics, changed the electronic harness. They got about three, four hours of sleep up at 4.30 this morning, took the car about a mile away to Portland Speedway, a half mile paved oval. Mears at 6 o'clock this morning in the car, taking laps. There was no misfire. The engine was working. They were smiling, even though there was no sleep. Now they're back out here on the road course. Sixth place, running well. Roger Penske and his crew keeping close tabs. And right now, they're very pleased. Back on the pit straight again, heading for the chicane at the end. And once again, tail Bobby holds off Emerson to the quality. You know, that kind of operation by the Penske team this morning, taking that car over and getting some testing with it, puts you in mind of the first year that the Chevrolet engine made its appearance in the Indy cars, when it seemed like at the start of every race, they would go out and find a parking lot. They they used the, uh, the Penske Cadillac parking lot one morning before uh, the, the race at Long Beach. They used the Wall Stadium before the Meadowlands, out just simply trying to get as much test time as they could on that car. Seventh place, Allen Sir Jr., Rick Mears sitting just ahead of him. There's one of the patches, and Johnny, those patches are a real concern here this weekend. Yes, they've been a problem through the practice and qualifying. Uh, the cars, they didn't figure on the cars, and here we see Allen Sir making a pass. Uh, he tries him on the inside, but he just doesn't quite have it. But the patches where the cars get so much grip in, in lateral motion that it was actually tearing the new paving away from the old paving that they, they had laid it over. So they have been working on that, and it appears that they've got the problem solved. Rick Mears, just ahead, number four, runs in sixth place. And little Al is going to try and moves to the outside in the chicane, trying to set up a good entry position for that first sweeping right-hand turn, but has to drop in behind Rick as the battle continues, and nothing has changed in the top eight positions since the beginning of this race. So Al Unser Jr. continues his pursuit of Rick Mears, and Tail Bobby continues to lead at Portland. Continues at the front of the field. Emerson Fittipaldi coming to the inside of Tail Bobby. Can he hold in that position? That's the new Alfa Romeo just ahead of them, and he gets past. So the lead has changed for the first time in his race. Fittipaldi gets around Tail Bobby in the Porsche, and now the Marlboro car is out in front. Oh, he made a resounding pass there. It, uh, you might have thought that he'd have, you know, had a chance to come up on Guerrero and use him a little bit. There you can see he's crowding him and trying to get uh, Guerrero's attention in his mirror so he can make a pass. But uh, Emerson, just when he made his, had his opportunity, he drove right by. So that is Guerrero now that sits just ahead of Benipaldi. Not a factor in this fight. He's one of the back markers in that now Alfa Romeo-powered march. But he became a factor at the front of the field. Now, there is Jeff Bramham as he works his way inside. Another back marker that was Guido Daco there. And the fight here is for fourth place with Michael Andretti still on the back. But look at Al Unser Jr. as he tries to find some racing room and get alongside Michael. Al was able to move around Mick, Rick Mears and pick up the position so he can challenge Michael. Oh, now this is a real dog fight. That is, uh, that is what it's all about. Racing very, very close. And of course, everybody trying. At this point, you've got to be very, very cautious because if you make a move and somebody else makes a move, you've got to be sure you've got an out because if you don't, it could cause an accident. So we continue to watch this fight. Jeff Bramham holding off Michael, and just behind Michael, this car, Al Unser Jr., trying to come up with a good result. He's been struggling a little bit the past couple of races. Yes, he really has, and it's unusual because they started out this season so strongly, and it's uh, it's hard to put a finger on anything. I don't know whether it's just some bad luck in the engine department or in the chassis department, but uh, Al has been struggling. So Al Unser Jr. has moved around Rick Mears, picked up a position, now lies in sixth. Rick back to seventh, followed by Lion Dyke, Bobby Ray. Scott Pruitt is in 10. At the front of the field, Emerson Fittipaldi was able to work his way around Tail Bobby. Only one lead change thus far in the race. But Tail Bobby, still with a great performance, is holding in there. Alan Sir Jr. screams down the straightaway. Now this 
team for the time being is just a one-car team, but there have been changes announced. Let's get that report from Jack Aroo. The kart racing community was startled yesterday when two of their top owners, Maury Cranes of Craco Racing and Rick Gallus, announced that they would merge in 1990, forming a two-car gallus Craco racing operation. The decision was a quick one and started Monday when Rick made a simple phone call. I think I called Maury uh, to ask him, to be honest with you, ask me if he'd be interested in buying cars from me if we decided to do our own car. And after we started talking on the telephone, I just, it just came across to me that maybe this could be more than that. And I called him and he said he had had thoughts about it. So it was almost, I guess it was, a, it was, a, I'll tell you, this guy doesn't let any grass grow under his feet. I talked to him on Monday morning or Monday afternoon on Tuesday morning. He was sitting in my office at nine o'clock. For Cranes, it means closing down his California shop and moving his people to New Mexico. The 50, 50 bases all the way down. Rick and I are co-owners, co-chairman, and we share the responsibilities. And Rick is going to be running the day-to-day -day operation. He knows it, and I don't. More importantly, for driver Bobby Rahal of Craco, it's long sought after Chevrolet power. This is a hell of an opportunity for me and for, uh, for the team. I know that um, it's going to be great to have Chevy, but it's also going to be great to be with Rick and, and great to have Al because uh, I know with Al, I can be honest with him and he's going to be honest with me. And, uh, you know, we get along off the track and I know we get along on the track. And as teammates, I think we're going to be pretty tough to beat next year. Bobby is, is my closest friend in IndyCar racing and has been for quite a long time. And uh, even though we, we, we've been on separate teams in the past, we've, we've talked openly and honestly about our cars the, the way it's been. And so now that, that we're going to be teammates with each other, I think uh, it's going to be even more so now. In my opinion, you're probably going to see, instead of maybe 30 Lolas, you're probably going to see maybe four or five teams uh, combining with other teams as far as selling chassis and developing their own chassis. Uh, that's what I think. Now, whether whether that happens or not, we we certainly are going that way. But we're going to still run the fastest car. Maury and I both agree that if, if we build a car and it's not the fastest, we're going to run whatever we get our hands on that is the fastest. Obviously, Roger's not going to sell us any of his stuff. <laughs> Him. He was running in third place, and that means everyone now will move up as something strikes into the Newman Haas team. Now, that uh, seems to be Mario's M.O. lately. He really has had a run of bad luck, uh, things just happening that uh, you never can count on. And of course, the only guarantee in racing is if it breaks, you get to keep both pieces. So that changes the order. Moves Jeff Rapham up into third place, followed by Michael Andretti, Allenser Jr., Rick Mears, then Ari Leyendijk. Bobby Rahal, Scott Pruitt, and brings Kevin Cogan up into the top ten, currently running in tenth place. And Michael still desperately trying to catch Jeff Brabham. Brabham, of course, has a whole string of second place finishes. One of those occurring here. And he would just love to get into that winner's column in the Indy cars. Certainly the way he's performing right now, he's got to get the attention of some Indy car owner. But then again, many of us would have thought he had everyone's attention before when he was so good in the Indy cars. Well, there's the order. Emerson Fittipaldi is now out in front, followed by Teo Fabi. He leads, followed by Teo Fabi, Jeff Brabham, Michael Andretti, Al Unser Jr. In sixth place right now is Rick Mears, then Ari Leyendijk, Bobby Rahal, Scott Pruitt, and Scott Brayton. Now, we've mentioned that Kevin Cogan was running in 10th, but then suddenly Cogan slowed down, and they sent out one of the emergency vehicles to tow him in. Let's go to the pits and get an update on these situations from Jack Aruth. Well, Paul, that tow vehicle has completed its task, and now the Newman Haas entry, they have to go, the crew has to go to work with their task. They're changing all four tires. They have assumed that the possibility is that in the electronic system that the black box is going to arrive. They brought a brand new box out. They're going to pull the bonnet and the side pods and make the exchange here. Uh, disappointed, Mario Andretti has lifted his visor as the crew has gone to work on the right side pod. They've removed it now, and they're going to make the exchange. Pull 
pulled the black box out. In the meantime, Kevin Kogan, who was having a fine run, has brought his car onto pit road. He has a problem with the pop-off valve. They are continuing to work just four pits ahead of Mario Andretti. What a disappointment for 49-year-old Nazareth, Pennsylvania, Mario Andretti, hoping to turn things around here, but it does not seem to be the case. As they are now going to work led by Colin Duff, they are going to exchange the box and hopefully restart the engine. Back to you. Well, you know, Johnny Rosenberg, there's more and more use of the computer technology, the chip technology, and it seems lately the more often than not when something is wrong with a car, that it it's isolated to that chip. Does that tell you and some of the other drivers that maybe the chip technology might not be worth it just yet, that maybe it'd be brighter to have an old, normal, analog kind of car? Well, for it to be in its infancy, uh, you know, the, as young as it is, uh, obviously that's the case. Uh, we just don't know enough about it, and they're not strong enough yet to handle the gap of the heat and the vibrations that they go through, and, and who knows what, what happens in one of these things. We always blame the black box, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of other things that can go wrong, and uh, more likely than not, whenever you change the black box, the car runs again, so obviously that's part of the problem. So the Haviland Kmart car. Michael Andretti continues to run in fourth place. Jeff Brabant is up in third, and Michael has his hands full trying to hold off a charging Allenser Jr. Let's go to Jack. Well, Paul, what you and Johnny Rutherford were surmising as to whether all this high-tech electronics is worth it or not, consider the situation that befell A.J. Boyd here. He has all that electronic technology, got it a little bit late. The electronic fuel management system was not on board his car in Detroit, and he had a pathetic afternoon. He bought one, put it on his car here. They couldn't get it to work right, although when it did work, he worked, ran very well. He withdrew his car from competition. He says that when he gets it ready, he'll be back to be very, very racing. So he needs it even if it doesn't work that well. Back up to you. And Allenser Jr. gets past Michael Andretti. You saw Michael wave and little Al both wave. I think they were trying to work out how they were going to get into that corner because they had a lot of traffic around them. Well, it was certainly close there for a while. He saw Michael lock up the uh, front tire, dragging it, getting in. So they were using their cars up for all they were worth getting through that chicane. So Al Unser Jr. now runs in fourth place. His next target will be Jeff Brabham, the third place runner. And that's not going to be so easy. Jeff is running a very steady race. He is, he is just absolutely pulled away. So you can see the distance there from Al's car up to Jeff, and he's got to close that gap. But if he can do it quickly, getting to that point will be one thing. Getting around him will be another. As they come onto the pit straight, you can get an idea when they get down into the turns at the end of the pit straight just how really rough some sections of this course are that has been a matter of official concern. We reported it to you earlier. Where those patches are, you'll see little Al's head just get pitched left and right in that car. It's really quite a bump, and of course, there are shoulders on all of these corners, but the drivers being drivers want to use a little bit of that and try to shorten the course as much as they can, so you'll see them put a wheel up on it, and that's pretty rough, too. Well, you have to to try to get One back. Off, you're going off. Jordan went for a little excursion, a little off-road racing there, Paul. But there he comes back in beside Ray Hall, and uh, the car looks none the worse for wear, so I guess he just got in a little bit hard and slid off the road. Of course, that's one of the things that you can do on a natural terrain road course that you cannot do elsewhere. If you, uh, you have a little overzealous corner and get off into the grass, if you're halfway bright about it, it it's like going off onto an ice rink. And look at this. Look at this. Michael Andretti comes off the course. Mario Andretti. Mario Andretti off the course. After trying to get it started again and getting out, Mario rolls to a stop, so it looks like after the second try, this could be it. Well, I, it, I didn't see the beginning of that, so it's, it's very hard to say, but he is out in the middle there, and if the car is, uh, in his estimation, out, uh, it looks like I don't look, they're not going to push him, so he's definitely stuck there. He's out of the harm's way, and I would say he's probably out for the day unless he can get a push or get them to uh, move him. So Mario Andretti out. Alan Sir Jr. continues his charge. He's come up through this field, now running in fourth, as we see a bit of a display at the back of the Scott Pruitt car, the number three Budweiser machine, but he seems back up to speed once again. the Alfa Romeo. Yes, he's, he stopped uh, 
stopped dead in the water there on the course, and I'm sure he would like to get pulled back to the pits for, uh, you know, for a chance to fix the car or to see if there's something they could do to remedy the problem. But he's uh, he's definitely uh, stopped, and uh, the trucks will come get him. Well, that was a team that was wonderfully pleased with the fact that they finished at Detroit in their first outing. They expect, as Chevrolet had to go through, Porsches had to go through, now they will have to go through quite a teething spell as they find out how an engine that looks good on a drawing board really looks in performance. You know, that's extremely hard, is to bring a brand new venue to the middle of a season, or to the beginning of a season even, because you don't have the time to really sort things out. So Emerson Fittipaldi is still out in front. 29 laps are complete. We expect the first pit stops to come very shortly. Fittipaldi took the lead away from Teo Bobby, who was the pole sitter and the early leader. We'll be right back. Johnny Rutherford, Gary Gerald, and Jack Aru. Emerson Fittipaldi, the number 20 Marlboro car, is leading the field, but he is going to abandon that lead for the moment and come in to get some refreshment from the Patrick team. There you see the crew jump out and get on that thing. Let's go to the pits and jack a root. Well, Emerson Fittipaldi had a problem on board with his computer computerized dash. The fuel light went out, indicating that they were running low fuel, so he's elected to come in approximately three laps sooner than they had anticipated. They make a normal stop, take out a full load of fuel, and he is back up very quickly. Well, the guess, jack a root, the guess was that most of these teams would wait until 37 laps. If they've scheduled 33 laps, I guess that tells you that they, as well as everyone else, are concerned about fuel here. As Fittipaldi comes back into the action, dropped down to sixth place from the lead as he roared out of the pits and now has to work his way back up. But of course, as all of the leaders cycle, then if they all have the same pit stop times, they should go back into the same order. The trick is that on a road course, the pit crews are absolutely criti critical. They can not only keep you in place, they can get you ahead. Oh, yes, definitely. We saw last year Danny Sullivan won the race here, and it was because mainly of his pit crews work getting him in and out quicker than anyone else. And of course, now Evelyn has made his pit stop. Uh, that will give him a bit of a, a boost when everybody else comes in. If, if they should get a yellow, then it won't help him. But, uh, you know, this is a critical situation, and it it may mean that they're going to have problems at the end of the day when it comes down to making it on the fuel. One of the emergency vehicles returning to station from a tow-in, we're still green on the race course, as Emerson Fittipaldi is our leader. Leading not quite half the first part, Tail Bobby has the honor to this point at least. But now having to work his way back up through the field, and of course, Tail Bobby is back in front of the race. We'll get a pretty good indication here because the Porsche traveling for all it's worth will get an indication of what its fuel capabilities are. We've never really gotten a good idea of how far that Porsche can go. No, we really haven't, and that's uh, that will bear watching because if he can stretch it out a little bit, then he's going to have an advantage. So the 20 car of Emerson Fittipaldi runs back in the field, and you can see that Rick Mears and Ari Leyendijk just ahead, but Rick Mears peels, peels off and heads down to the Pence. The Penske team waiting to service him, as is Jeff Brabham. So both of the Penske cars stuck together. We need to know at this point if this is strategy or if they've actually got fuel lights, if they've had the indications to come in from their from their instrument panels, because if, if it's not in it's strategy, then that's one thing, but uh, it, could, it could mean that the fuel situation is going to get a little slim at the end. Rick Mears gets away first, but they struggle with the left rear on Jeff Brabham's car. Long stop, 26 seconds, and Jeff Brabham finally rolls back in. So a bit of a problem on the left rear of that car as they were struggling to get him back into the fight. Tail Bobby still runs in the lead, the Penske team, and here he comes. The Penske team made their stop on lap 32. Let's go to the pits, Gary Gerald. Now down off the mark, it's 19 and a half seconds. There's a weak 
Love Nut just rolled away from Munster's car. Fabi may have hit it. They're working now on little Al's car. Rubber on the left side. He's up on his jacks. No opportunity to pick up the full time. Now they have the starter engaged at the back. Down off the jacks. They've got to disengage the starter. They pull it out of there. The car, I believe, is under fire. I'm not certain. They're putting the starter back in. They've got a problem trying to either engage or disengage the starter at the rear of the car. They're having all kinds of trouble here for little Al Luntzer. Let's go now to Jack Aroot. Well, Gary, in taking a look at some additional pit stops here, and in answer to Johnny Rutherford's question, one of the things that the leader, Emerson Fittipaldi, discovered, they had assumed that they would go 33 to 34 laps before a pit stop. But two laps before he came in, as early as he did, the light, the fuel light, indicating that you're out of fuel, flashed intermittently. The following lap, it went full on. They did not want to calculate a guess this early in the race, so they elected to follow the electronics and bring the car to pit road. In the meantime, several other teams have run out of fuel. Bernardo Jordan and the Alfa Romeo Guerrero both completely out of fuel. That's why they came to the pits. Back to you. gave up on the starter and you saw from the view backwards from Alistair Jr.'s car that they just decided to push it to get it going. That takes there's the view backwards once again. Now it's speed. That takes a little courage on behalf of the crew. Not only do you run the risk of getting down the, the pit lane in a little bit of danger, but also it's not easy to push start one of these cars when it's so hot and it's shut down. No, it really isn't, Paul, because they tend to want to vapor lock when they shut down. They get a lot of heat sink and uh, it just boils the fuel in the lines and uh, extremely tough so they were fortunate in getting fuel pumped up here we see uh, Scott uh, Brayton being pushed a little bit there I don't know whether he's going out or whether he's trying to get restarted so Scott Brayton suffering his problems as well as two crew members and two cart officials try to get dim down closer to his pit area as Emerson Fittipaldi with that series of stops resumes the lead of the race and coming out in second after the stops is Tail Fabi on board with Derek Daly now the Rainer car just ahead of him is Raul Boisel the uh, team Shearson machine yes they as you recall in Detroit they had a little problem running into one another and they have had on several occasions so this will be interesting to uh, to watch here it's a battle for ninth place Boisel has it at the moment you see after Derek went over that patch the car takes quite a bump so that patch definitely is a rough area for the cars to run over we're back with the leader Emerson Fittipaldi in second is Michael Andretti we'll be back what sport best defines the word action what exemplifies the perfect marriage of man and machine where do these men of action go for news of their sport? I stay on top of things when it comes to Indy cars. But when it comes to all the racing news, I read on track. There's only one place I go for my auto racing news. My on track, of course. At the office, I really don't have much time to read. But back and forth on races, my magazine's on track. On Track is Auto Racing's news magazine. Only On Track has the answers when it comes to auto racing. Published every two weeks, On Track is 100% pure auto racing from cover to classifieds. Order 25 action-filled issues of On Track now for just $19.95, a more than 30% savings off the annual subscription rate. Call 1-800-333-5093 now and take advantage of this limited offer. Don't be the one asking the questions when one phone call will get you On Track. G.I. Joe's 200 at Portland as Rick Mears has hooked up with Tao Fabi in a battle for third place. And Rick is going to try inside the Porsche. Uses all of that curve. Forces Fabi to use quite a bit as well. Comes back, uses a bit himself in a neat exchange with Rick Mears. As Mears tries to get around Tao Fabi. Boy, that was a try, that's for sure. Of course, uh, Rick is able to close that gap back up because uh, Tao has a slower car in front of him there. And that's... You know, they're catching slower traffic and getting inter intertwined now, so it's it bears watching, and it's uh, getting slick out there. The tires are plenty hot. Everybody is bobbling around, and uh, it's really it's really a race. That's Scott Atchison that they both get around. Interestingly enough, he is a protege of Rick. Rick's giving him a lot of help as Rick tries again in the fastest part of the course, trying to use the advantage of the Chevy, and the Chevy does it for Rick as he gets around tail Bobby. Did we say this guy was racy or what? Uh, I think he is. Showed that in his uh, practice here. He was very, very quick, and now look, he just pulls away and gets some distance on the Porsche. You wonder, though, you've got some pretty good brain power in that Porsche pit between Derek Walker and Peter Parrott. I wonder, Johnny, if they didn't take a look at 
their fuel situation because those pit stops seem to tell you with 104 laps distance that this is no longer a two-stop race, that they're going to face a third spot. Maybe Derek Walker and Peter Perrin said, tail slowing down a little, we're going to pace it for a while. What do you think? It could be. Good will be. It'll bear watching anyway, Paul, because that's the only time you ever fool with a boost is to turn it down and maybe take a little strain off. Let's go to the pits. Update, Jack Aroot. Well, Paul, what you're looking at is some fuel calculations that are taking place in your leader's pit in the Pat Patrick pit. Now, Pat Patrick has been working with him, checking the fuel mileage based upon that first stop. And Pat, checking to see if Little Al had stopped. Pat, you only went 30 laps on that first round of fuel. That could make this a three-stop race for you people. Yeah, it'll be a three-stop race. We just hope we finish, Jack. Is fuel going to be the big factor here? It's a problem for us. Severe problem. Well, we've seen an indication that maybe all is not well in the leader's pit. Let's go back to you. Well, a very candid Pat Patrick there. Normally, he guards himself a little more than that. We said definitely a three-stop race. And definitely, look at that. There you saw the signboard. Two more stops yeah. given to one of the teams. So uh, there's a little question about it now. What started out in the game plan for almost everybody at the two-stop race now looks like a three-stop with Pat Patrick telling you that the leader, Emerson Fittipaldi, may not have enough fuel to go the distance, and if they're in that shape, you have to assume other people are as well. Now you think, you'll know now that they'll have to turn the boost down and do some short shifting. But now, now comes that chip technology as we watch Al Unser Jr. closing in, trying to come back around Emerson Fittipaldi and get back onto the leader lap. He's a lap down at the moment. Yeah, he's making a pass on DDA Thays there. liquid crystal display, that new dashboard in front of him. Now Al at least has a little more information on what is happening in the car, happening in the engine. You see how slick it's getting, too, as you saw him pitch the wheel and catch the car there. So maybe he has some better information now. Well, I, you know, Paul, at this point, I can assure you that you're not looking at that instrument panel. You don't have a chance to glimpse at it trying to keep the car on the road. So as fast as they're going around here, there's not much attention paid to that instrument panel except maybe to check to see that, that maybe the temperatures are just right. But uh, at this point, he's not worried about that. He's leaving that element to the crew. The crew has to figure that for him so he doesn't have to worry about it. He can drive the car and watch the road. All right, so out in front, Emerson Fittipaldi followed by Michael Andretti, Rick Mears, and then Teo Fabi. As the lead begins to close down, let's take a look at the latest in racing technology in this ESPN trackback. Trackbacks are brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil. The big Q stands for quality. Always has. Always will. Here's Jack Aroot. One of the key elements to getting around quickly at a racetrack in IndyCar competition is downforce. And most teams create their downforce by a combination of rear wing and front wing. Now, a front wing that comes from the Lola factory looks like this one on Derek Daly's car. But once the cars are delivered to the individual teams, well then, an engineer's imagination takes over. Now, some teams elect to make major modifications to their factory-issued wings, like the introduction of these side wing flaps onto Bobby Rahal's Craco Lola by Steve Newey, their new engineer. Now, Steve came from Formula One competition and the Aeros team, where these are used quite extensively. Now, Steve says he'd be hard-pressed to tell us just how much additional downforce these account for. But in a sport where winning and losing is dictated by split seconds and fractions of an inch, every little bit helps. Well, Emerson Fittipaldi is back in front, being chased by Michael Andretti and Rick Mears in the G.I. Joe's 200. We'll be back. Fittipaldi is the leader of the race here. 43 laps are complete. Fittipaldi continues to hold his lead, but a problem developing as that was Scott Brayton, and there is Michael Andretti. Michael is a second-place machine, the Haviland car. Well, Michael Andretti with his problems out of second place. Emerson Fittipaldi being the leader of the race and the rest of the field able to work its way past. Allinger Jr. lined up just behind Emerson Fittipaldi and trying to get his lap back. Fittipaldi running about 23 seconds ahead of the rest of the field. The rest of the field being represented in second place by Rick Mears at the moment. As Michael Andretti, the Horton safety team out, 
picks him up and will tow him back to the pits, hopefully to get restarted. He could restart here. It's a matter of getting on the pavement and getting the car in gear. He's probably got the clutch pushed down, ready to uh, do just that, although he is staying off of the road. Uh, well, the Horton truck is off the road, too. They're waiting for a clear yes, area to come back. Getting back on in now. There. Well, Michael Andretti might be able to get restarted. Involved in contact with the Scott Brayton machine. And look at little Al as he tries to get around Fittipaldi and get the lap back. They're wheel to wheel shades of the Indy 500. As these two great drivers continue their ongoing season long fight. But in this case, it's simply little Al running in seventh, trying to get around Fittipaldi and get back on the leader lap. Well, the indications now are that very shortly we'll be seeing yellow flags flying all around this circuit because there's plenty of debris that has been kicked up by a couple of off-course excursions. Johnny, you can't let the dust, the grass, the gravel lay out on the course too dangerous. No, you really can't. It's uh, these tires, even though they uh, they are extremely tough to uh, lateral G-forces and uh, working and, and, and making the car operate properly, when you run over a piece of gravel laying out there and the sharp side is up, it can puncture the tire very readily, and that's something you don't want to happen. So, uh, the safety teams want to get out there and sweep that track, get it clear for them. The yellow flags begin to fly around the circuit now. And very shortly, you should see one of the PPG pace cars come up and gather up the leader. And then Little Al, that's why you've not seen Little Al too aggressive on the backside of the course, because he knows that he has to line up behind the leader. And Emerson Fittipaldi makes a move for the pits. Fittipaldi on lap 45 now makes a turn down into the pit area as the Patrick team ready to go to work on that car again. And Little Al picks the lap back up. They fuel the car, they change the fronts, and they go to work inside the cockpit, John. And it's very hard to tell what the guy might be doing in there. He's adjusting something or maybe trying to get the, the reset back on the, on the fuel indicator. So it's, it's hard to tell. And goes away down pit road nearly fast enough to hold off a charging Rick Marriage. You know, Rick's wife, Chris, yesterday, I looked at her and she said, you know, Rick just might win a road race this year and it just might be here. And then I started watching him and he really looked great in the qualifying. He's really been placing that car. He has had the confidence and he is going for it, that's for sure. So Rick Mears, under now a full course yellow, it's finally become a fact. But Tarek Daly under the yellow, there goes Rick Mears in front, gets off of the course, <laughs> and now starts to come forward and back on, come up to speed as Fittipaldi comes around as well. So we have a full course yellow at Portland. The Penske team takes advantage of it to stop Jeff Brabham and get him refueled. He was running in sixth place as he came into the pits. So under the full course yellow, the fields will come up behind the pace cars and they will be led by Rick Mears. We'll be back with more from Portland. Of course, yellow, as you can see, the problem is exactly what we alluded to at the start of the race. This new surface and the tremendous side force exercised by these cars as they pass over it has begun to tear the track surface apart literally picking the track surface up and moving it over. The crews are trying to get, look at that, all of those pebbles and de pieces of debris off the course. It looks like they will be there sometime. Let's go to Jack Arute. Well, Paul, another problem that's taking place is on the leader, Emerson Fittipaldi. Now, we've talked about the fuel situation. Here's what happened when Johnny Rutherford was talking about short shifting and adjusting the boost. Now, of course, we know where the shifting lever is inside the cockpit. Do you see this knob I have my hand on? That's where a driver can control the boost dictated by the pop-off valve from 45 inches on down. So what Emerson Fittipaldi and some of the other teams are going to have to do now is adjust this back just a bit. Not as much horsepower, but hopefully better fuel consumption. Now, when he came into the pits, you saw one crew member dive into the cockpit, so to speak. He was trying to get to these buttons here to reset this computerized LCD display, which keeps all the information and is later downloaded, keeps a driver alert as to RPM, speed, and fuel consumption. They're not totally convinced yet that this isn't one of the culprits, that this electronic box is giving them false readings, but they don't want to gamble right now. Back to you. Well, I wouldn't want to take that chance either, Jack Root. Out on the course, they are under the full course yellow. You're on board with Didier Tays. Now running down in 14th position. And a chance for him. You know, this yellow is really going to be a real advantage to these teams who were concerned about their fuel. There is Jeff Brabham. 
he, of course, is in this car because Danny Sullivan is still having trouble with his broken arm. He brought the car in early a week ago in Detroit. So it's cost him at least this race and another. Let's get an update from Jack Aruth. Danny Sullivan's bone-breaking crash during Indy 500 practice has required more than the orthopedic expertise of Dr. Terry Trammell. Pain and time have exacted their toll on the kart world champion. If I was going to have to break my arm, Indy was the best place to do it in terms of the track because it's one of the easiest tracks we do in terms of driver effort uh, around the track. Uh, I don't necessarily say I would have been a threat late in the race, but but I think I could have done, of all the races, I think I could have finished there easier than any place. At Milwaukee, Sullivan expected discomfort, but hoped physical therapy would enable him to survive and possibly win. The kick back in the wheel, the vibration, uh, the track is a lot more physical, being a one mile over, uh, just how much I depended on that right arm. And uh, I started the race and ran as high as fourth, and I thought, well, this isn't, uh, too bad, but then when the car started getting loose, I couldn't correct properly with the wheel. I, was, I wasn't functioning properly in the car, uh, so I had to consequently slow down, and the vibration was bad, and then I had a tire vibration, and it just seemed to magnify, and you realized how much was coming back through that wheel right onto the brake, and that it was going to be a real problem in, in the car. Last weekend, though, his worst fears were confirmed. A 17-turn bumpy road course wrestled Sullivan's arm and won. Detroit, of all the places, probably the absolute worst start. If I had gone to another track that was a little smoother and maybe not as many corners, um, then we probably would have been better off. But that just too, was just too hard on it. And then, of course, uh, the bones started to separate, and Dr. Trammell grounded me. Dr. Trammell had told me what the consequences can be. Um, I'd look kind of silly to stick it in the wall or have an incident with somebody else because of my arm. So I just thought maybe it's better just to uh, go out right now, park it, and, and uh, be done with it for a while. Danny accepted his fate and has stepped aside for two races, giving way to Jeff Brabham here and Alan Sir Sr. at Cleveland. No longer at the wheel, he came here Friday to watch. I'm not a good spectator. Some people can stand there and watch, and I, I wish everybody the best, but uh, it's not going to change anything, me being here, and, and it just kind of eats at you being here at, at a place that I really enjoy. I've had a couple poles here. I've played all the races I've been in here. Uh, I won here last year. You're defending champ. I love the people of Portland. Everything's really good. And to come back here and just walk around is uh, something I can't handle, so... Um, I'm going to watch a little practice and, and then go home. Danny Sullivan, a spectator at Portland today, replaced by Jeff Brabham, who works his way around with the rest of the cars on a course that is badly torn up and led by Rick Mears. But still, fuel is the question yet to be answered. We'll be back. I'm Paul Page with Johnny Rutherford, Gary Gerald, and Jack Aroot. Rick Mears leads the race. Ari Leyendijk in great position in second place, followed by Bobby, then Fittipaldi, and then Bobby Rahal. They have the course now clear, though they're still concerned about the track surface. 52 laps are now complete, so they'll be coming to the cross flags indicating halfway, but also a green flag at the same time as the pace car is on. And they begin to pick up the throttle. Rick Mears sitting back in the pack. Leyendijk sitting just behind him. The green flag given. That's Mears, the bright yellow car, the Pennzoil machine, coming in behind Al Unser Jr., who runs in eighth, the lap off the pace still. And for the first time, they will now get an idea of how much work has been done on that course. Yeah, they are coming around turn number two, heading three. Three is for the clock. The racetrack coming apart, Paul. He looked backwards now, and that's the leader, Rick Mears, that bright Pennzoil number four. And Tail Bobby gets off the course, gets right back into the action. That's some of that loose racetrack that the asphalt coming apart, I'm sure, has caused him to get slip and get off of the course. So this is going to bear watching. This is the problem corner. So Tail Bobby with a quick off, then back on. Rick Mears out in front of this run. Ari Leyendijk is chasing him. There you see Bobby coming past. And there is Mears coming on to the pit straight. He's managed to put Raul Boisel between himself and Ari Leyendijk and been using that Chevrolet power to his advantage to try to get away from Leyendijk. So this
this race has a couple of question marks working for it. Number one is the quality of the track surface as we watch the 20 car of Emerson Fittipaldi. And Fittipaldi manages to improve his position by getting around Lyondike and picking up second place now. Bobby Rahal comes forward as well. So the top of the order changes and there you see the positioning of Fittipaldi and of course of Rahal. So the question is the quality of the track surface. The question is also one of fuel. Do these teams have enough fuel to get to the end of the race? Pat Patrick has already said they don't think so. Well, that's that's the big question, obviously. And, and this racetrack coming apart that badly, causing cars to slide off of that turn. It's uh, it's going to be something to watch because it's you know this kind of a situation has never existed before, and uh, if they have to go red flag, that will obviously help a lot of the teams to. Uh, get their problem solved and maybe figure out what they're going to do. But uh, with the racetrack coming apart, it's uh, something we've got to watch. And there you get a view of the leader, Rick Mears, the Pennzoil car, as we look backward. Look how, how the back end comes loose. I think you get your best idea of how a car is handling from this view and also the speed. Now there it is. You can see he, he can make it once he gets the power down, but it's very hard to get the power down in that turn three with all of the loose. It's like loose gravel. It would be like running through loose gravel, and it's very treacherous. So Rick Mears tries to work his way around Little Al, but Rick does have the lead. Let's go to the pits in Jackaroo. Well, Paul, Chip Ganassi is the co-owner of the Marlboro team with, uh, with Emerson Fittipaldi on board. Chip, you're equally concerned about fuel. Now, let's set the story straight. With the amount that you've got on board here in on pit road, can you go the distance? Well, with the amount of fuel we have on pit road, yes, we can go the distance. How sure are you of that? Well, we, we, we came in on our first stop, Jack. We came in two laps early. We were getting an incorrect reading from the computer, as we were, if you recall, at Indianapolis. Fortunately, we have, a, we have a handle on the incorrect reading on our first stop instead of on our last stop, like it was at Indianapolis. Well, let's check in with Gary Gerald for more stories breaking here on Pit Road. Gary? Well, Jack, we've talked about the fuel situation for Teo Fabi. We have talked with Derek Walker, also with Tony Sicali, the men who make the decisions. They think that they got in their window okay. They believe that there's not a fuel concern, at least for Teo Fabi and their crew. Now, quickly, we should also update the track conditions. Assistant Technical Director and Operations Manager for Dark Billy Camphausen, we got a quick word with him about the trip track conditions. They said they'll continue to observe, they being the people in race management. It's their call. Drivers were, of course, aware of this possibility in the driver's meeting this morning. If it continues to deteriorate or get worse, then they have to make that very tough decision as to possibly having the red flag. Right now, we're on the green, however. We'll just have to wait and see how this track holds up under this record heat here in Oregon. Thank you, Gary. Now, Johnny Rutherford, while we watch the leader, Rick Mears, we do need to begin to extend our thinking just a little bit because with the track breaking up, we saw it really badly broken up by the halfway point, and with fuel in question, though somewhat helped by that long full course yellow, there's a possibility this could be the race that nobody finishes. <laughs> yeah, we talked about that. That would, that would be something if we had a race where nobody was to finish, and you'd have to go back to the scoring to decide the winner. But uh, this track condition with the, the gravel constantly turning up in turn three, can be a problem later and of course you just have to stop there you'll see the guys slow way down to get a chance to get through that corner without having to slip and slide on it and that's all you can do so rick mears is out in front running at average speed to this point of right at 100 miles an hour and he really is putting together a pretty good and a very bright race emerson fittipaldi lies just five seconds back followed then by bobby ray all ari lion and then Jeff Brown. 57 laps complete. We'll be back. Back at Portland with a great fight now developing between Bobby Rahal and Ari Lyondike. For the moment, they have Gary Daly in between them. But the seven car of Lyondike and that 18 car of Rahal have been fighting with one another. Then in the middle of all that comes Derek Daly, who's a lap behind them running in 10th place and has managed to hold up Ray Hall for just a little bit here. But very soon, Ray Hall should be able to come back in contact with Lyondike. Yes, this is a situation where he's got to close up very tight right through here because the speed he can carry off of here is what he can use to get by him down this straightaway on the backside. And just behind that is, look at Ray Hall. He's not at all pleased with, with the positioning of Derek Daly as he raises a fist from the cockpit. Exasperating whenever you try to get somebody lined up 
up like that, and you know he's a lap down to you, and you can't get by. So Ray Hall, there he goes. He gets a chance to pull out, slipstream a little bit, make his presence known, and then out break him into the turn. There he pulls over, he gets the line into the corner. Now they're on board with Derek Daly as Jeff Brabham gets around as well. That really breaks up your momentum, and momentum is so important. It really does, and it's a, it's a rhythm you almost get into. You, you have a, you get the feel for it, and you're cutting good laps, and suddenly, if you're, if you're slow enough that somebody makes a move on you, it upsets that rhythm, and you're going to start all over again. There's the leader, Rick Mears, the Pennzoil car number four, turning laps now at about 115 miles an hour as we take a look at the race summary. The leaders, of course, have been Tail Bobby, Emerson Fittipaldi, and now Rick Mears. One full course yellow, though there have been individual standing cautions throughout the course. The attrition has not been what we expected. Tom Sneva, Mario Andretti, Bernard Jourdain, and Roberto Guerrero, the only cars out of this race. Now at lap 61, I would have expected a good deal more. With this heat, I would have thought so too, but uh, there again, it's uh, the guys are using their heads and not taxing that equipment as hard as they maybe could. Well, Fittipaldi is narrowing the gap just a little bit. He's carved it down a second in the past three laps. He was running a about five and two tenths. He's now four and one tenth behind. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Well, let's talk a little bit about what contributes to fuel consumption on a road course. Here is a spare rear wing for the Penske team. It's big, it's bulky, it's not at all like the super speedway small trim rear wings. It creates a lot of drag on the long front straightaway and on the back straightaway where speeds are better than 170 miles per hour. When you create drag, you have to use more energy. You use more energy, you use more fuel. That's basically what it boils down to. Now, you can trade off and run a smaller wing here at Portland, but what you gain maybe as much as 10 miles per hour on the straightaway, you lose in downforce, and then you slide through the corners. So they have to achieve the balance. To achieve the balance in this race surface, everybody's using these large wings, and they're all eating up the fuel. That's just part of the problem that all these teams juggle with week after week on the IndyCar circuit. Well, all of racing is a compromise to try and find out how to go as fast as you can. You still have to get all the power down, and you still have to have the downforce. That's where the compromise comes in. You're on board with Al Unser Jr. That is the three car of Scott Pruitt, the Budweiser machine line just ahead. And they are fighting for seventh place. Young Scott Pruitt now beginning to show his teeth in the Indy cars. He was tentative in the early part of the season, but he's looking pretty good now. Yes, he is. He's, he's done extremely well. Finished second in Detroit last week, so Scott is starting to get comfortable. He's getting confident with the car, and, and uh, that's the name of the game. When you can get that, and you can go out there, and you think, on any given day, I can win this thing, then you make it happen. Well, you see Rick Mears, the leader of the race, right in behind this battle for a seventh place. Scott Pruitt really scored all of his championship in sedan-style racing, the IMSA GTO cars, the SCCA Trans Am cars. Coming to an open-wheel car is a whole different world. Oh, it really is. It's quite a bit different. In fact, uh, it's apples and oranges. You can't compare the two. He, kind of like comparing an L1011 to a jet fighter. Yes, yeah, right. And it's, it's a situation where he's he's made the transition very well. And that's, a lot of that is mental. You know, it's, it's a mental uh, transition. He gets a chance to get out and be able to and see what it's like, and then he makes his uh, two plus twos and goes ahead. What a great view of Scott Pruitt, the number three Budweiser car, chased by the Valvoline machine of Al Unser Jr. in a battle for seventh place. Rick Mears is still the leader of the race. Could it be his day to win on the road course? Unser Jr. in pursuit of Scott Pruitt comes to the inside in the first turn. They're side by side. Al over the curb and into the side of Pruitt. Little Al slides off of the course. Pruitt continues on in that fight for seventh place. But Little Al, he can get going again. Back on course. Oh, his wing is knocked way out of shape, as we can see there. Take a look at that rear wing. Al Hunter Jr. has a problem. He'll go to the pits. In the meantime, let's get this report from Jack Aroon. Well, Paul, the heat down here has been almost oppressive, but this is carrying it one step too far. A water main is busted here on pit road, and we are holding it down now right in front of Emerson Fittipaldi's pit. Let's go further down pit road to Gary Gerald. Little Al. 
Bell is now in. The rear wing dragging as he came in. The crew over the wall, and they want to replace it. They've got the spare out there, but this is going to take a tremendous amount of time. And the young man who got his first ever IndyCar win here on Father's Day five years ago can only sit in the cockpit now and contemplate what might have been. There'll be no victory today for little Al. The question right now is whether or not he'll even be able to get back out on the course as his crew just keeps scrambling back and forth, trying now to replace a bulky rear wing. Paul? wing went down you have no idea besides the wing what kind of damage it might have done to the wing mount and they seem to be having their problems trying to get the uh, bent and broken material out so they can put a new wing in now let's take a look at this again on board with little Al he tries to get inside Scott Roy yeah he's pulling down on the inside heading for the chicane trying to outbreak him up over the curb arch he lost it there and spun as they touch he's still got it running you can see his oil light going there and he gets the car in first gear gets back underway and of course the wing was broken and uh, I'm sure he felt it dragging as he picks up speed here and it was all over. Looking at it in slow-mo now from a, a first turn camera both of them side by side into the corner as Scott Pruitt, uh, Pruitt simply held line. his line. Uh, he held his line and he had the line and Lil Al was a little out of position and when they touched uh, having to get out of the throttle that just set him free and away he went. Of course, the rule is the race course belongs to the guy in front. The uh, responsibilities for the overtaking car. Yes, he's and there's little Al's he's view in slow motion. He's taking way too much of that curb there. Of course, there he's out of, he was hit and out of position and spins into the wall. But he was bright enough to kick the clutch in. All that caught the uh, Armco barrier here was the rear wing. He was able to drive the car back in because he kicked the clutch in, kept the engine going, and now the crew works on that wing. So Al Unser Jr. involved with Scott Pruitt. Pruitt continues on. They have the new, look at that. Not only the wing, but the wing mount. What they're attaching there is the whole back end of a gearbox. All right, there you see the tray he's holding. That's the exhaust tray that covers up all of the gearbox and the lines running under there. That's the stainless steel tray that they put in place for the exhaust to channel down. The actual mechanism back there is the wing bolts into a bracket, and the bracket allows some adjustability. Randy Lewis has come to a stop on the corners in one of those corners that has been a problem. But they decided that the brace was not even in good shape, and they had to take the casting that is the rear of the gearbox on Little Al's car and replace all of that. So they're waving the cars to the inside of the course. Rick Mears is still the leader. Yellow in that section for Randy Lewis. Emerson Fittipaldi runs in second. We'll be back. The crew was laid out for a fuel stop. Emerson Fittipaldi just worked his way past. The Penske team was ready to give him some fuel, and suddenly he slowed on the corner. Oh, it, it appears, I would guess, that he's out of fuel. I think the thing must have quit on him there. He can't get it restarted, obviously. The fuel is, is gone way down. That may be the case. He is out of fuel. Well, Rick is staying on the course, so he wants somebody to tow him around. He hasn't tried to pull it away. Let's go to Jack Root. Well, Johnny Record, Paul Page, that may indeed be the problem. Now, they have a special drill that they use to build the fuel pressure back up when they take on fuel. The engine has died out on the racetrack. They called for the tossing of that special drill. They're waiting for Rick Mears to make his way here to pit road. They think as well that he's out of fuel. Back to you. And Rick Mears now signaling to the corner marshals, get me going. I want to get on this race course. I don't want to pull it off. I think they're a little anxious about the position the car sits on the race course. But Rick, it's not going to turn those wheels off the course. He's going to try to keep it going no, and, and hope that he gets a tow. Rightfully so. He, if he stays out there, they will hook up to him with the emergency truck and pull him in. And look at this fight come around the corner, though. There is the leader, Emerson Fittipaldi, but stuffed right up his tailpipe is a second-place car, that 18 Krakow machine of Bobby Rahal. Yes, that's going to be a real dogfight. Rahal's hungry for a victory, and when he gets this close, you just you can become superhuman. Now, in the Rahal car, we're talking the Cosworth engine. Given the fuel situations, here's an engine that doesn't seem to perform as well. But now Rahal goes into the pits. What I was going to ask was, does it get any better fuel economy? Well, I, it's very hard to say. You know, they both have an electronic fuel system, so it's a matter of which one gets it set up to do which. But Emerson Fittipaldi, of course, now is still out on the race course. He has stopped here for fuel. So Let's go to Gary Gerald. Well, we're watching this Preco crew work. Bobby Rahal with a cool drink. He flips the back over the top of the wall. They've been in 14, now 15 seconds. They're trying to get all the fuel they possibly can in. He engages the clutch as they come off the jack and really smokes the tires. 18 and a half seconds 
Jasper Rahal. Let's go to Jack Aruf. Gary Gerald, as you watch that pit stop right behind me, there's been a lot of spirited discussion between Roger Penske and the cart people. He's saying, tow my car in. We've just run out of fuel. So far, they have not done that. Also want to remind you people in the booth that Emerson Fittipaldi pitted under that caution. So he's got a little bit more pad than the rest of these guys in terms of fuel on board. Now, we understand that Rick Mears is now finally being towed onto pit road. Let's go back up to you. Well, there's Roger Penske, certainly worried. He takes control of the Rick Mears car when the car is actually on the track. Mears is under a tow from the Horton safety team, so he should be able to get the tow into the pits, get refueled, and get going. Going back to the Ray Hall Emerson Fittipaldi situation, with Ray Hall making his stop first, if he can go to the end, when Emerson makes his stop, he will be able to pick up the gap, and that will put them back racing one another, and that will be very interesting. Ray Hall may have just made the key move. Now, remember, though, that Fittipaldi also made a late stop under that full course yellow, so the tactics played by the pits are so critically important here. Emerson Fittipaldi, the 20 car, out in front by six seconds over the other Penske car, Jeff Bravo. That puts, that puts poor Rick Mears down about three or four laps at least here now, or maybe even five laps for the leaders because he sat on the course waiting for the tow. Well, Rick has dropped out of the top ten now, back to 11th place, continues to drop further backward. Once they get that car into the pits, there will still be some work for it because it will be hard to restart. As suggested, the Penske team does have a drill that they go through to try to get fuel pressure back up. There we see the camera. There was Mears in the pits. So Rick Mears now making his stop, getting some of that precious methanol fuel as they already go to work trying to get the engine to crank. And Ari Leondike comes off the course back on quickly. The advantage of a crash line race course, if you were on a temporary circuit on a street course, that would have been the end of Leondike's day. It would have been the concrete. They're a little bit forgiving. Though that can be quite an exciting ride from time to time. Car seems to speed up when it comes off onto the grass, doesn't it, John? It really does. It gains about 50 or 100 miles an hour at least. You know, Ari Leindyke's done a good job today. He's steadily moved up. And of course, he does well on this track. He's uh, Some of his best finishes and some of his best qualifying has been right here. His best results have indeed come here as Leindyke works alongside Guido Daco down into the first turn. strong on this course today. Could this be their possible best effort? As Emerson Fittipaldi works his way around the track in the 20 Marlboro car and the red and yellow flag tells you this course is getting slick again. You're watching the leader Emerson Fittipaldi. He's about 39 seconds out in front of the second place car of Bobby Rahal. Jeff Bramham has already made his stop and in doing so ended up coming out of the pits into third place. Now the indications are that Emerson Fittipaldi should stop just any moment now. He is waiting for the light to come on on his dashboard. They're going to trust the light to tell him it's time to come in. At the same time, Bobby Rahal has made his stop and they say that he is good to the finish of the race. Now the Fittipaldi car is in radio contract with the Patrick team in his pits. There is Bobby Rahal working his way around. Will the Patrick team be able to complete the stop and get Fittipaldi rolling before Rahal comes by on the main stretch? Now this is the last stop in the competition. There is very little fuel in the fuel tank, so that means the fuel will flow slower, agonizingly slow for that crew as they watch the fuel go in. It doesn't have the pressure of a lot of fuel in the top of the tank to push it down. There is the Fittipaldi crew. They're ready. Fittipaldi works his way around this track, ready to go. The second place car is now charging on the course and Fittipaldi comes into the pits. Let's go to Jackaroo. And Emerson Fittipaldi hits the marks very nicely. The crew checks the tires. It looks as if they're going to elect not to make a tire exchange just to add all the fuel they can to Emerson Fittipaldi's Marlboro Racing Team entry. Fittipaldi engages the gears. They've dropped the jack. They send him off the way very quickly. Hopefully to go to victory lane but they don't know. Back to you. So Fittipaldi fires and is rolling down the pits just as fast as he can go, while Rahal is still running through the turns on the backside of the course. So Fittipaldi is able to stop and maintain.
take his re leave, but we'll have to check. The question will be, and Jack Aru will check it for us, whether or not Emerson Fittipaldi has enough fuel to go to the end of the race. And look at this as Jeff Brabham has managed during that stop to pick up a position on Ray Hall, and Brabham moves into second place. So Jeff Brabham is now chasing Fittipaldi. Yes, and that's, they've still got some distance between them, so it's, it's going to have to be a condition that Emerson would have to run into some sort of a, some sort of a problem out there for these two to catch him, but they are putting on one whale of a race. Well, when Fittipaldi came into the pits, he had a 37-second lead. Now his lead has been shaved down to 17 seconds. There's something coming out of Brabham's car. It is spraying something out the back. You can see as he came through that last turn, it suddenly just let go. So I had definitely a spray of a vapor down at the bottom of the gearbox. For the moment, it doesn't seem to be slowing him down, but Rayall seems to be sensitive to it. And now out of the side pod. It appears he's got a water leak or something. There you go. You can see how bad that is. It's, yeah, it won't take long for Radiator or cooler line is let go as they're on the pit straight. And Rayall is very carefully moving to the inside, but he's going to be careful as he approaches that car because he's not sure what that fluid is. And he sure doesn't want to run through anything slow. Disaster if it were to take both of them out here and give Emmo the uh, the clear shot. Ray Hall is uh, not within striking distance by any means, but you never know what can happen. What an unhappy situation for Jeff Brabham. This car suddenly letting go on him, the Miller machine, after Brabham gave it a really superlative ride here today. Brabham still keeping the car in the fight, though, and there you see how he skates the car a little bit. A lot of gravel down in that corner. Guido Daco is out of competition, sitting over by the side of the wall. This could bring out a yellow flag, certainly in that area there is now. The question whether or not, with the course deteriorating, Guido Daco sitting by the course, and perhaps very shortly a Jeff Brabham if we see another full course yellow. That would certainly help. The only thing good about Guido Daco's situation there is he's in the shade, Paul. He's out of the hot sun here. The temperature's climbing to the high 80s at Portland. Magnificent, beautiful day here. Emerson Fittipaldi, look how he tiptoes through those sections of the course where you can see the gravel all over yes, the track. It's very, very dirty down there with all of the uh, racetrack coming apart, and so they have to pick their way through or take the chance of spinning. Well, you can see by the display of the multiple flags, the white flag when displayed on a corner tells the driver there is an emergency vehicle on the course just ahead, and there you see it, the Horton safety crew out in front, going out, no doubt, to co collect up Guido Daco. Yellow flag out at most of the turns now, again because of the debris that has been spread across the track. Yellow flags fly. I think that's in the general area when they're waving one like that. If they're waving double yellow flags, then you've got a full course yellow. Let's go to the pitch and Gary. Paul well, Roger Pinsky may have won just a very small battle. He grabbed Billy Camphausen a moment ago. He said, that's fuel you're seeing. He just came in at a full load of fuel. They pulled the black flag. They're going to continue to observe. He's back on the course at least for one more lap. The key here, as far as the problem crew is concerned, he did not have to come in. Well, what we saw was fluid rolling out at the bottom edge of the, of the side part of the car. I have trouble thinking that that would be fuel at that point. I would, too, especially up in the front like that. That's in the general area of the radiators, and uh, if, he had a, if he had a radiator leak, stop leak fluid in it or something so it's you know, it's very hard to tell at this point exactly what it might have been on the other hand if it if it was was cooling fluid you'd think that that engine would have about had it by now yeah obviously it's not that so we'll, yeah it's uh, anybody's guess we'll have to wait and see the Horton safety team pulls Guido Daco back into the action gets him up they'll take him back to the pits as Bobby Rahal continues to chase Jeff Brabham and Rahal has radioed his crew he'd love to see Brabham again very treacherous Paul it's, it's just like running on uh, pea gravel out there in the turns Rick motioning there he wants to get pushed to get restarted again if he possibly can uh, it's just a, it's a shame that uh, the track's coming apart like that because it's been such a beautiful race and a beautiful race course black flag was just displayed to Jeff Brabham telling him to come into the pits the officials want to look at that car 
So Roger Penske, with this car being called in into the black flag and Rick with a spin, once again having their problems, the Penske organization, and Rahal now deciding that it's wiser to try to get around this car, closing right up behind Jeff Brabham in another display of vapor, this time at the bottom of the gearbox. Yeah, I would think that that would indicate some... Uh, Rahal moves around, picks up second, yeah, I and Jeff Brabham now realizes that the day is over. Yeah, he I drove think. it just as far as it would go. Yes, I think the uh, temperature finally got up to a point. We saw the, the spray at the back that was uh, oversprayed from the back. It's smoking heavily now. You can see that. I would think that he just ran it out of water and uh, overcooked it. What a terrible disappointment. The two Penske cars in the same lap sitting by the edge of the race course. So promising and yet gone away so quickly. Rick Mears was leading this race for a time. And Jeff Brabham who hoped to have his best day ever in the Indy cars, was running in second, was in a position perhaps to challenge the lead, and now his day is done as well. Yeah, they were throwing water on Brabham's car. It, it, it generated so much heat under that engine cover that uh, uh, they were trying to cool down some of the parts. You can see it's smoking still badly there, so that's a shame. Jeff uh, gave it a good try today. It's, uh, it's a shame that the car had to do that for him. So many fans of Jeff Brabham really looking for him to do well in the Indy cars. He does wonderfully well in the Emsa GTP cars. Rick Mears is now on the tow rope and I'm sure hopes to get restarted. So maybe the Penske's can salvage some and he, the tow rope slips through his hands. They'll have to bring it back and give it to him. Yeah, he lost the tow rope there and so have to start all over and that costs valuable time. Of course, the time he spent stopped is uh, it's, uh, too much. Well, Mears has dropped out of the top 10, running in 11th behind Roger Penske there. Chris Mears, very dejected. For Jeff Brabham, what a disappointment, but still, he did a lovely job. Yes, he certainly gave him uh, gave a credit of himself, and he, he will be asked back, I'm sure, or maybe even get a ride out of this for next season. So it's, uh, that's what you look for. Start of the day, he said he was going to drive it for all he was worth. That's certainly what he did. Rick Mears loses the tow rope again. But he's got, he's got an engine going now. There's Ray Hall going by. Rick Mayer is not a factor any longer. Out of the top ten, Bobby Ray Hall is in second place. The question mark now is Emerson Fittipaldi. Pat Patrick speculated before the race slowed just a bit that Fittipaldi may not have enough fuel to go the distance. 92 laps are complete, 104 the scheduled distance. Will Fittipaldi have enough to finish? What do you think, John? Well, that remains to be seen. Uh, the timing on the thing and the way they suddenly seem to gain confidence back in, in the interview that uh, yes we do have enough I would think probably they may be shaving a little close call but they'll I think they'll make it if you were fit and running in the league would you be complaining about this racetrack asking for a full course yellow uh, no I don't think so I want to get as much distance between myself and second place as I as I could and he's got about as much now as he needs let's go to the pitch and check well, the amount of fuel that Emerson Fittipaldi took on board his car, because this tank is indeed empty, was only 24 gallons. So it is still questionable whether they're going to be able to go the distance, but Morris Khan, who calls the shots here, said he radioed to Emerson to go ahead and turn the boost to full up and go racing. Let's check in with Gary Gerald. Gary? And we stand by with Roger Penske. I know it's a great disappointment. I guess they've got Rick back running at this point. Comment on the problem that he may have encountered, Roger. Well, he just said he got a little wide on the fast corner. I guess I didn't see what it was. He got in a marvelous that he slid off. That's all. Uh, we ran him out of gas, so I guess uh, we had the worst mistake today. I know you were frustrated because they wouldn't get him restarted as quickly as you'd hope. No, I think they got out to him as quickly as they can. You know, when you run out of fuel, you just hope they will tow you in. How about Jeff Brabham? I know he gave it a gallant drive today. You have to be pleased with his, his effort as long as he was able to be there. He ran fine. I mean, it's a real credit to him jumping in the car here in just a couple days of practice. He did a great job. Thank you, Roger. Roger Penske commenting on the fate and the fortunes of his team today. It has been a struggle, Paul. Well, I hope Roger Penske, and if not Roger, some owner keeps in mind the skill and the performance of Jeff Brabham. Emerson Fittipaldi is still the leader. sections of the course that are scattered with debris, with gravel and chunks of asphalt. Rahal has been closing down just a bit. Yes, he has. He's been gaining uh, substantially, but uh, Ammo has been taking it easy and rightfully so. The racetrack is very treacherous, and he's certainly in the lead. This late in the game doesn't want to spin out or have a problem. 
There comes Bobby Rahal. That's Teo Fabi, the pole sitter and early leader of the race. As Rahal tries to catch the leader, Emerson Fittipaldi. Will it be another victory for Fittipaldi? Rick Mears, who had his problems earlier, is back and running on the race course. There's been some other action here during the past few minutes. There is Rick Mears when he got off the course earlier. The quick spin almost to the wall, but he was able to keep the uh, car off the wall and finally get a tow and get the machine going. Now, this is on board Little Al's car a little bit ago, and ahead is Scott Pruitt. Little Al running in 11th place, chasing Pruitt down and trying to get around him. And look here, Scott Pruitt, the back end goes loose, comes around to watch Little Al. Little bit of a reward for the situation earlier, I think, when Little Al got together with Scott Pruitt. So Scott Pruitt, fast spin, but back to the action. Yes, and here we see Emerson Fittipaldi, who is, is tippy toy. He's not really putting the arm on it. He's taking, picking his way around the racetrack, and he's still able to maintain a very comfortable lead. 101 laps are complete. 104 laps, the scheduled distance. Fittipaldi picked up the pace just a bit on that last lap, running at 118 miles an hour. They qualified 119, so he's back up at a pretty good pace, considering all of the asphalt particles that are scattered all across this course. Bobby Rahal, the 18 Krenko car. Let's go to the pits, Gary Darrell. Well, Paul, last year, Ari Leondike got the best finish of his career on this racetrack with a second. Dick Simon urging him on here on the radio now. He's currently in third place. If it weren't for two spins, you'd think you'd be in the lead. Yes, actually, Ari was trying real hard, and he uh, went into that spot on the track where the track was kind of breaking up, and he lost control. And, of course, then he was behind. So then in trying to catch back up again, which he was doing at about three seconds almost a lap, he spun again. So right now we're just trying to hold our own and finish third. And, uh, God willing, the car will hold together the next two laps, and that's where it'll be because Ray Hall is not pulling away from him, and Tail Fabby is not catching him. Thank you, Dick. they got to be happy down here for Ari Leondike, Paul. That beautiful black number seven for Vimy car, Ari Leondike, running in third. Certainly had his shot at the front of the field as well. Two laps to go now. Fittipaldi still the leader. Will it be potential back-to-back -back victories for this Indianapolis champion? He sure looks solid, but the question is still, is he running on vapors in that fuel tank? Well, that is the question. Can he make it to the end? Everyone seems to think so, but we won't know until he takes that checkered flag. And that could be agonizing for the next two laps for him. Fittipaldi now may have actually too much information from that lovely onboard computer system as the white flag comes out to Fittipaldi, indicating one lap to go. He may be able to tell exactly how much he has left, and it just may not be enough. Fittipaldi on the white flag lap, working his way around. That would certainly be exasperating to have led uh, most of the laps today. And uh, now he can afford to pick his way around. He's got a comfortable lead coming through turn three there where he knows that there's been a lot of spins, a lot of problems, into turn four, heading out onto the backside. Let's go to the pits, Jack Aroop. Well, let's check a quick look with Pat Patrick. Patrick, you're almost down to it now, Mr. Patrick. Can you make it? Yeah. I think we're down, we're on the right flag line. We feel pretty good right now. Well, they're still crossing their fingers down here, but they're waiting for Emerson Fittipaldi to come across the stretch for the final time. But Jack Aroop, he's tiptoeing his way around the course now, still keeping the speed up certainly not with the verb or the power that we saw earlier as he makes that turn onto the pit straight. The 20 car, the marker machine of Emerson Fittipaldi. The checkered flag and Fittipaldi has won it. He nursed that car through rough, gravelly courses and a very, very long fuel tank to pick up the win. The Krinkle machine, number 18, Bobby Rahal, password power, comes off that final turn and onto the pit state. Just ahead is the checkered flag for Bobby Rahal, who will come home in second place. And Ari Leondike goes off the course once again, keeps it under power, and gets back on. Tail Bobby is running in fourth place and should not be a threat to Ari Leondike. So with this off and on excursion, Leondike can maintain third place. Yes, and of course Ari likes this place, and that will fit in with his uh, with his MO. So that, that's good to see Ari and uh, Nick Simon get a good finish here. Uh, they, they needed it. So Ari Leondike will come home in third. 62 laps of this run to take the checkered flag and back-to-back -back victories a week ago in Detroit. Now this week at Portland, what will it hold in store for us next week at Cleveland as Leondike finishes his race and Emerson Fittipaldi now can drive slowly.